Ready when you are. Hey everyone. So I would like to reintroduce, or if you're new to our show, the world renowned and famous chef Walter Stabe, who is a Emmy award winner. He is a James Beard nominated chef. He uh, started a foundation called the Caribbean Culinary Federation. Um, he is part of our history because he also is the um, culinary ambassador for PA. And you are also, you've won so many awards. It's amazing. Like it's, it's an honor to be in your presence again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me so bashful. I mean, it, you know, honors are great, but it's not what it's all about. You know, what it's all about is sharing your knowledge with other people and, uh, bringing the world to them as well. Not everybody gets a chance to travel to Ecuador or Australia or Madagascar or places like that. So we bring it to them. This is all the my whole purpose in, in life. After 26 years of entertaining people in my city tavern in Philadelphia, unfortunately, COVID plus many other little situations made us finish the restaurant. So hopefully... They're going to get it uh, reconstructed, life safety issues, and yeah. God knows. And I told the, them, whoever's going to go back into it, I help them with the food, but I don't want to run it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but would you would you also be participating? I mean, because you still own it, correct? No, I would just participate in the culinary. Okay. I would make sure I give them all the knowledge and all the research that I've done. Matter of fact, Today, we're speaking about uh, history. It's actually a pretty sad day for me because David McCullough died yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, he is uh, obviously a world-famous author. Uh, I'm just one of the few lucky guys that got to know him extremely well because when he came to Philadelphia to do his research on John Adams, guess where he had to go? <laughs> to, to, you. The city, to the city tavern. Yeah. I cooked up a lot of their meals, and then we became friends. Uh, and uh, it was a great sounding board for me. Uh, he also did three forewords of three of my cookbooks. He did a foreword for my uh, baking book, for the City Tavern book, and for my Sweet Taste of History book. Now, two of the books are still available on our website. Uh, the, the first one I mentioned. And the Sweet. The, the first one is out of print, correct. But two of them we have so, but... I got to know him extremely well, and he came by the city tower many times. Matter of fact, I remember spending one day with him and uh, uh, Molly Schaefer from 60 Minutes. We did a 60 minute show on John Adams, and he came by, and I always served him the kind of foods because we knew we knew a lot about uh, because you know you know John Adams was an avid writer. He communicated with his wife daily letters. Yeah. And he would write exactly, hey, I've been here today, and I had this to eat, and I had this to eat. So we did the research. A lot of stuff was you were able to find. So it happened today as well. So I'm here, kind of, well, he was 89 years old. I mean, don't, I mean, you know. It, so he lived he had, a good life. He definitely had a good life. And unfortunately, his wife passed away just only two months ago. So they're all together again, happy. And uh, Phil was uh, uh, was teasing me. <laughs> Phil, my producer of my show, he, he said, oh, now they can all get together up there and talking about Mid Washington and John Adams and everybody. And I said, I don't know if there's enough room for all those guys <laughs> up there. <laughs> Could you imagine that tablescape of like having all of the historical figures and like, you know, all of their different um, meals that they have eaten or prepared? Yeah. Or, or better yet, can you imagine? Him explaining to Washington, Washington and Jefferson and Adams things like Chick Fil A and <laughs> I wouldn't I, I wouldn't want to be the guy explaining it because those guys they would go go crazy. Remember, I mean, in those days, uh, food was still a very important thing. People wouldn't. I'm, there was fast food, like we consider get a piece of salami and a piece of bread was kind of. The idea of fast food and a piece of cheese. Yeah. But all the stuff that we have evolved to, especially the last two years, oh, mm, I wouldn't want to talk about it. Well, one of the shows that I had watched that, you know, you have out there, you you 
actually specifically um specified i don't remember it was like the antigua i think maybe um that charcuterie right now it's you know something where it's like well it's elevated and you know we we enjoy it as you know something that's like it was saint augustine special. saint augustine show yeah and the, and the, the trick is really interesting remember when the people would uh, come by the sail ships over from europe they didn't know what to expect. They obviously had to bring enough provision with them. Yeah. So having the ham hanging on the rafters and dried food and cheeses would have been natural. And yeah, you're right. Now <laughs> it's just big, the big thing. Everybody talks about tapas. You know, few people even know where the word tapas comes from. I mean. Care to, to let them know? <laughs> well, tapas really came, you know, sweet wine, like sherry, Madeira is very sweet. Guess who likes sweet? Lies. So way back when, in Greece, in, in Portugal, and many other places, when you ordered uh, a, a drink, like the glasses I got sitting over here, the restaurateur decided to take a piece of bread, toast it with something on it, which became the cover. So basically, you have the cover, this is the tapa. And that's where the word came from. Tapas comes from that. And then they got more fancy. The next guy put a little dead. The next guy a little anchovy. The next guy maybe a little sardines on top of it. And then we became, now it's a, a whole cultural thing. Everybody's cool. It's a charcuterie. Everybody's talking about, oh, I'm come over to my house. <laughs> I'm going to have some charcuterie. And I'm <laughs> I know where it's like super, or you go out to eat, eat and you get like little, little amounts of everything, yeah, yeah. but like they charge, you know, anywhere upwards to $30 and on, you know, sometimes more. Whereas back in the day, it was just your regular, you know, thing that you had in your household or, you know, on the it, ships. It, exactly right. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was just down and visiting my, my grandkids in Maryland and the Eastern shore. And, uh, my daughter was on a big play, and so I had to drive all the way down. But when I see her, she did spectacular, by the way. And so my uh, my daughter said, oh, make it easy. I'll have a big bladder of charcuterie before we go to the thing. And I'm saying, you guys, everybody is getting hooked on that. Oh, God bless COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm going to circle back around because yeah. you obviously like for anybody who's new to to listening to the show, new to you, um, you have such a huge hit, like knowledge and in, in vast um, understanding of everything that's happened in America's history. Um, but obviously, that's something that you have to learn along the way. So where where did you become inspired or when did you become inspired to to start you know delving further and further into our history and then sharing it obviously with the remainder of the world well it's very interesting to tell you i had no interest in american history honestly i did the bistros i worked in france i worked in italy uh i had big 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 corporate jobs and but i was never really into uh, uh history or politics, none, none of this kind of stuff. You know, yeah. you know, you remember I'm from Germany. I was supposed to be here only for one year. Yes. I'm still here. And we Lo love having you here. <laughs> Long story short. It really all began that uh, my consulting business uh, was in overdrive. I was working in India, in Brazil, in Thailand. I mean, all over the world. People were looking for expertise like myself because I, I brought together two things, the culinary aspect and the design aspect and the marketing aspect. So I was, I was a full service uh, consulting firm, if you will. And a friend of mine said to me, he said, you know, the city tavern, uh, which got closed, they're looking for a new operator. I said, I wasn't going to go near this place. I had, I had uh, lunch there one time and I had some frozen flounder. I don't think I want to go back to a place like this. I said, yeah. oh, never say never, look around one day. And the one day he convinced me to come there. I look at it and I fell in love with the, the, the third floor kitchen. And I said, that might not be a bad idea because so I have a kitchen for me as a laboratory because I had to do a lot of research. Remember, concept development, food development in the old days without cell phone <laughs> was a very complicated thing. You have to take a picture. You got to take it to the photographer. You got to, they got to print it and you got to package it up and then you got to send it off. So think about it. Now I can take a picture and seconds later, 
Send you it. like you like the plate or you don't like the plate, you know, kind of like that. And so uh, then I said, then I got interested. And part of the interest was really that convinced me to do much further because you have to do an RFP for the Department of the Interior. Whoever operates the city tavern as, or gets picked as an operator has to be approved by the Congress of the United States of America. Because of it being a historical. And also to make sure that it's not going to be wet t shirt nights and taco nights and all those kind of crazy things, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, beer flights and stuff like that, even so, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so part of this whole exercise was for me to get a great, great tour of other historic sites in the city of Philadelphia and along with the personalities. And I had taken to more books and more reading. And the more I looked into it, I said, wait a second, there's something wrong. Because in Europe, when I grew up, our appreciation for American cuisine is very low, meaning it's just basically steak, fried chicken, a few little things here and there, a couple wannabe Italian restaurants and a couple of that and a couple of here in those days. I'm, yeah. I'm, talking, I'm, I'm talking the 60s, you know. Yeah, and, th and that was what it was. Yeah, and so, you know, I kind of, I, I said, reading those books and reading those manuscripts, I said, you God, give me a break. Whatever happened? Because in those days, I mean, if you look at it, and that's, it's easy to understand. People like Thomas Jefferson and others that traveled to Europe, uh, got in, fell in love with French food or European food by and large, not just French, the Northern Italian, the Piedmont region, all, all that, and brought, brought it back home to their estates, not to the general public. And reading all that, I tell you, I mean, I, it's like... So the more and more I got into it, the more I said to myself, I, if, if I got to be, become a believer, then I got to tell the story to the rest of the world. And what better way to, to start with it, with the city tavern restaurant. So obviously I spent a ton of money. I put a, put a big shop into it because I knew that I couldn't do an 18th century restaurant without baking my own bread. I can serve you a, Bread, or I can have Sarah Lee be my pastry chef, you no. know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, ba so basically, uh, that all came about, and we opened uh, July first, ninety four. Uh, obviously, a lot of detail work got in the middle of it, and I know that we were going to get approved because I spent a tremendous amount of time. But what really drove me, honestly, was the sophistication levels of the of of the the the, the seventeen. Started already late in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century uh, at, at the estates, m m by meaning the estates, the people that had means. Now, the common folks was a little different story because of the, you cannot compare those two. I was con concentrating in the beginning really on the, the big uh, events of the, of, of the time. I mean, I'm the one of the only chefs, well, at least I know of, that cooked in the first five presidents' homes. Think about it. Uh, I got invited. I mean, for me, it was uh, there was uh, there was a good amount of luck in the middle that I got to know some right people. I did a lot of uh, early lecturing in Mount Vernon, and met a, a, a curator from Monticello, Susan Stein, is her name. And uh, Susan was impressed that here I am, a foreigner, so into this uh, culinary uh, history. And she said, you know, we are rebuilding right now our chimney in our kitchen up in Monticello because the chimney was kind of falling apart. When the chimney is ready, I'll invite you to come up and uh, for film a couple of episodes. I told her at the time I was planning on a taste of history. It wasn't even completed yet. It was still in, 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 in the early stages. So when I got this call one day and she said, the kitchen is ready, you guys can come up. So we went up for this first season and filmed four episodes up there with all the foods that were Thomas Jefferson's favorite, who, who also happens to be my favorite uh, uh, 18th century. Forget that he was president. I'm talking to him as a culinarian, as yeah. a guy that a researcher, uh, discoverer, if you will. You know, I mean, anybody that will steal some upland rice, uh, the threat of death in Piedmont and schlep it back to, to Virginia to see if it grows. 
and uh, all his uh, wine growing business. And we won't talk, we, I don't like to talk much about the failures. He had, he had a few, but by and large, it was, was fantastic. So anyway, long story short, long story short, we filmed four episodes, submitted it, and got two Emmys out of the first season. One for me as a personal Emmy, even with my accent. <laughs> and uh, the other one was for uh, uh, episode number four, that I cooked uh, in a situation that will never be happening again. Because when, when Thomas Jefferson spent time in Europe and he, he brought James Hemming with him, uh, and Sally Hemming's daughter, so kind of keeping it all covered. Together, you understand? Yeah, oh, yeah, under, under wrap. And uh, he saw how the, the French chefs, even at the time, would have like a finishing stove where they would cook bulk over open fire and a hot iron like I do on my show. And then they take it over to a, like a 32 inch high uh, uh, stovetop, which is uh, filled with charcoal from the fireplace. And where they do finish the final sauces. And they could, uh, they, the name of this is called the stew stove. And mm -hmm. so basically uh, Monticello had this rebuilt, but Monticello rebuilt it 100% correct. It's another one in Williamsburg, but it has an exhaust on top. Mm. It's not historically correct. So the one in Monticello, they let us use one time. <laughs> and if I tell you how many EMS people were out at the parking lot, you know, first alert in case anything goes wrong in there, carbon monoxide or whatever. Yeah. So basically in the show, I'm saying this is a really one for the history books yeah. because it was it never it will never happen again. Nobody else will light those fireplaces they're just for the people to see it so anyway this is how the initial thing started and then obviously show after show different things and we kept kept busy you know uh, understanding and also a lot of research you know that, that that we do which has not stopped matter of fact uh, phil right here <laughs> he can speak for himself how how much time it takes uh, on one subject like we go into kentucky and uh uh, Saturday. Matter of fact, what I brought you is not a burger stew, which I got so much flack by everybody saying, do you have a burger oh, stew? The, yeah, the stew. No, the burger that. stew I already did on season 11. This time it's a complete different thing. I'm actually doing an elk pot roast and a gourd soup and a, a stock cake and all kinds of goodies. Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm finalizing with the hard cook uh, what we're going to collaborate together because there has to be some the chemistry you always have to be right, but yeah. the research for the shows, the other things that fills it in, you know, the, the historians, the what other sites you want to use, you know, that's what's important. Uh, the end of September, we're going down to Pensacola for a big reunion because I cooked with three top chefs. Fantastic, fantastic episode. Usually with other chefs, uh, I, I don't know if I necessarily would want to have George Perrier on my show. <laughs> You understand? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> those three guys have a pretty high uh, pedigree, but we worked it out fantastically. And so now we're going to reunite all of us for a fundraiser. What's the fundraiser for? Uh, the UWF trust. The, the, for the trust. So we're flying down there, uh, and I'm going to cook up uh, my West Indy pepper pot soup that was very popular in the city tavern. and cook it in one of the guys' kitchen, and so we do that. And so basically, whenever uh, uh, to, to help to promote the show again and help to promote the history, because we filmed the actual show in, in mm -hmm. the historic uh, little district of uh, Pensacola that most people don't realize that Pensacola is actually a little older than St. Augustine. Hmm. Inter 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 interesting story. So, you know, it comes to that. So, and in that kind of like, circles into what I was going to ask one of the things I was going to ask you which is you know what you what have you been up to um more recently and you know you are always like winning awards because you you're bringing so much depth and understanding and not on, only that but you're also you know providing recipes and just history like the multifaceted um aspects of everything that you're bringing is why you get so many awards um but you brought along with you one of the other the latest awards that you have won which is daughters of the american revolution which honors you walter 
with a prestigious Americanism award. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? It was a very moving experience. I will be honestly tell you that uh, I don't, nobody took pictures. So if I had some tears, nobody would know about it. <laughs> it was uh, a really spectacular. It was up in uh, Scranton. Uh, it was the national uh, convention. It was the national board and uh, it was uh, really moving. I mean, seeding through the, the whole experience of them explaining why they're giving it to me because it's not given to an American citizen. Well, you have to become a citizen. Yes. So in other words, you have to come here and then decide to stay here and then become a citizen, be naturalized, and then you qualify for this award. Now, behind the scenes, what I didn't know, Phil was working with many people, you know, to say, hey, what do you think about this guy? And we'll make sure it's the right kind of guy. And I got a beautiful plaque at home. It's not even, I have no more room on the wall. So somehow I got to find a, find a spot for it. But it was really a beautiful event. And the way the way the whole thing happened, now I've done many things for the DER many, many times, because obviously I have a, a very soft spot for reenactors and for people such as the daughters of the American Revolution and the sons of the American Revolution, as a matter of fact. Because I think... Uh, we are in such a turmoil that we like to forget about history and we taken down statues and we would we we trying to change our history and it just bothers me a lot, you know. So so basically it was a really beautiful uh, it, it, the whole thing was really beautiful and the fact that I got nominated for it and got this award given, which is not given every year. This is an an occasional award meant a lot to me. And in, as it should, um, you know, and it's one of several new awards that you've won this year. You know, you you also have increased your uh, Emmys Emmy count. Yeah, well, we, <laughs> we got two more Emmys on, uh, on on season 10, 11, unfortunately, with all the with all the turmoil and with the COVID and everything, virtual things kind of got a little messy. So we'll see the new show, uh, which is ready. Uh, the networks decided to start it later, actually better for us because more viewers. Uh, so October 1st, if you're around at noon, October 1st at noon is the first uh, first Phil produced show of season 12, Phil. Tell him. You want me, you want me to tell him? Tell him. Uh, well, I mean, we are excited for season 12, as Chef announced. Uh, you know, it's kind of been a long process here. Uh, you know, everything was held up with COVID as most people's lives were. So, you know, we don't feel any sort of pity for that. Uh, but I think it's certainly a testament to Chef Stave's will to keep the show going after City Tavern closed, um, you know, and everything was kind of put on hold. Our distributors for the show put everything on hold. And so we kind of had to do a little self-reflection and decide if we were going to continue with season 12, um, you know, and but people may or may not know, uh, you know, shows that are broadcast on PBS, you know, are completely nonprofit. We don't get any sort of funding from PBS. Um, so it was really kind of a dedication to our fans uh, and uh, them, uh, you know, providing their support. You know, people constantly emailing us, writing messages on Facebook. Are you guys coming back? And we miss your show. We want you to come back. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, um, donating money to the show, which helps us, you know, continue production. Um, and so chef, me and chef sat down and we decided that we want to do season 12 and we picked some locations together. And honestly, I think it's, uh, you know, one of the best seasons we've had, um, the show's kind of evolved since season one. It's real neat to, you know, go beyond, you know, just the production value, how much it's incre increased in 10 years, you know, we're, we're filming in 6k now. Uh, you know, top of the line production equipment. Well, actually, for this upcoming season, we'll be on DirecTV's 4K channel, which there's few shows that even have the capability to air on there. Um, but, uh, you know, we kind of evolved the show. You know, Amaris, you kind of mentioned it, you know, working with locations, chefs there, um, you know, just kind of let them tell their own stories. You know, whether it's, you know, the Native Americans there at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, you know, cooking food, indigenous food from the region, um, you know, that kind of tells their their stories, um, you know, working with a chef in the Ozarks um, as he forges through the forest there, 
um, kind of cook all that food. So just chef kind of letting them tell their own stories, letting all these locations tell their stories, and then, you know, exploring the history, you know, 18th century history. We dabbled a little bit in the 19th century in this uh, 12th season. So a lot, a lot of exciting new locations. Uh, we were able to complete the season, as Chef mentioned. Uh, October 1st is the first air date on PBS. Uh, we'll also be streaming on Amazon Prime and some other uh, streaming video on demand services, such as Tubi, Freevee, um, Roku devices. Um, so basically, the way you know the way smart TVs are now, if you just ask your TV to play Taste of History, they'll find a channel for you. Um, but you know, so, so if you're looking for me and you cannot find me, uh, it's your fault. <laughs> you're right. Everybody yeah. found, but, but 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 this was season 12. Now, 13, we're going to Kentucky on Saturday, and we can talk about it. But we already did the first uh, show, which was unbelievable, went all the way what you call it again up Maine, uh, down east Maine, down east Maine. It's confusing because you're. Yeah. Up north, Metal, <laughs> up north in the down east. Matter of fact, uh, lobster fishing at uh, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, you did that? The, we did everything. Oh, that's awesome. We did. We, I had to, they had to get me out of bed and say, "If you want to see the sun, the, the, the sunrise." That's the best way to do it: is not tell him before <laughs> you just wake him up at four in the morning and just say, "Hey, get in the car." <laughs> so we those ones were done, and then obviously we have an exciting lineup. We're going to Australia for sure. Uh, we're just waiting for the the final dates. Uh, we're going. You can tell us a couple more uh, interesting locations that we're going to. Uh, I'm hoping that we get everything squared away with uh, Madagascar. I really want to go to see where the beautiful vanilla grows and the coffee and the many other things. So hopefully this is going to all work all out. So yeah, we are full. Like I said, full 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 speed ahead. But I mean, it's it's fun. It's fun to see. Uh, like I said, uh, the DVDs are already ready, so I bought you some as a as a souvenir for you to watch alone, not to put it on promote. Up, yes. no, no promote. I appreciate. That. Uh, well, because normally, normally this time of year we already on. So, but now we honor. It, we, yeah. Correct. Now we honor them, so we're not going to release them or sell them or make them available until the show airs. But right now, which is very interesting. Uh, more and more people that I, that I see in the farmer's market or walking around uh, on the street say, gosh, I said, what should the other night? We are, because we are now at 7.30 every Wednesday night on WHYY. Oh, nice. Where they're rerunning Seasoning 11 to kind of re-promoting the new ones coming up. So, matter of fact, the one that's coming uh, on this Wednesday night okay. at 7.30 WHYY, it's called Swimming with the Pigs. Which is very interesting in the in, in, in Exuma, uh, to went out there and uh, I didn't really believe this is such a thing. Yeah. That the, the pigs swim, but the pigs are so trained and swim, they're coming right to the boat. And, oh wow! And and interesting, <laughs> interesting enough, initially they would feed them uh, hot dogs, and then the Humane Society or somebody got in the middle and said this is really not good. So now they get carrots. Yeah. But they still come for the carrots out there. So that's part of that. And then we cooking with some uh, local guys. Their grandmother's uh, recipes, uh, and it's, it's quite interesting. So this is Wednesday night at seven thirty, and then it keeps on going until uh, we're going to go to Ecuador. The final show is going to be uh, uh, Galapagos Island and uh, Manabi and in, uh, in Ecuador. So that's, and then it wraps it up, and then hopefully uh, the season twelve will start airing, and then and as you hear from Phil, a million thousand ways to uh, get a hold of uh, stay up here. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm not for nothing. I kind of want to crawl into your uh, luggage to to join you on some of those adventures, um, and even just to see you work too, because it's it's interesting, um, you know, because we at home we have modern kitchens, modern tools, everything's a lot easier, but you with your shows are actually like bringing it not just with a taste of history with, you know, regarding the, the different me uh, meals that they used to prepare, but you're actually preparing those meals with the equipment that they would use back then. Yeah. Um, what is that like, you know, just the experience of it using the, the tools that, you know, they used to use versus like in your own kitchen at home? Well, it's look, honestly, it's uh not as easy as it looks. It looks easy on, on TV. 
Uh, also, there's a lot of editing going on, as you well know. <laughs> yes. Uh, you have the right equipment, so you know all that already. But uh, it's 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 different because yes, you 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 work uh, with, with different tools, different equipment. It, but it also depends on the chemistry you have. Like the one I, I cooked up with in, uh, in in down Maine or up Maine, whatever it's called again, <laughs> uh, uh, was really interesting because I cooked uh, with a lady. We made a uh, moose stew that she, the lady is in her late 70s and she actually shot the moose. Oh, wow. Because you, the moose uh, uh, is given by lottery. You get a, a ticket and then you get to shoot the moose. So she and a friend went and got the moose. And uh, so we did a moose to right, right on the beach where the first naval attack happened, right? Yeah. Right on the same beach. And we smoked the salmon the old fashioned way, right on a, a plank. Okay. Right. Uh, the cedar a plank, plank. And cedar plank that was soaked in water and in the ocean for a while. So it was interesting. So they're, they're all different. And then when I cooked at the, uh, at the farmhouse with, uh, with the other chef, it, it depended on chemistry. It's difficult sometimes. You got to make sure, like I said, uh, you got to. But I, 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 I kind of see the show in my head completely, and and the the biggest thing is you got to keep calm, uh, as much calm as you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep calm and have a good organization, and I have good people, and uh, uh, the, the 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 TV, the the, the production crews knows the recipes because. Uh, Phil makes sure they have everything on hand so they understand what's happening. Few things should be changed around, but it's difficult. The biggest thing, what I, what I have found over the years, the mistakes I made was not being specific enough. In other words, not telling somebody to have a water spray bottle there because the lights mm. make everything, everything wilted or not making sure that the wood is the kind of wood that I really prefer to have versus the wood that would just give me. It's just not any firewood. You know, I need foot would have extra heat, you know, yeah. so you can do it. And also making sure that we have the right equipment uh, on hand and those those kind of details. But look, by now, after so many hundreds of shows, we got it pretty much down to a science. But it's still nerve-wracking. And it's still, believe it or not, as much as I've done, I could sit here all relaxed, cool in the air-conditioned environment. When showtime comes, you still, I still get the butterflies. So I still got to, yeah, I do. Well, no, I totally understand. It's every, because we record, Um, everyone knows this, you know, who who's a fan of this show. Um, But we record on, on Mondays, obviously. Um, Sunday nights, I don't know why, but I always get like so nervous I don't sleep. So it's like, I understand what you mean. Um, I, I found, I, yeah, I, I do have my own cure. I mean, it's actually very simple. I could have told you. It's a, a couple of Mountain Dew will do it. <laughs> <laughs> Commercial for Mountain Dew. Here you go. There you go. But but uh, uh, the diet one, actually. <laughs> 10 calories. But uh, yeah, it, it, and, and you know, the, the good news is, it, is the good news is, uh, Amaris, and you know that, I know in the back of my head that uh, uh, we're not filming live to tape. So if there's any anything and as long as the other people know it as well yeah then just more of a relaxed they can understand if you drop some flour on the floor or something you know i mean i wish that uh, some people in early on who started in this in this business had this luxury you know yeah like julia child <laughs> and she screwed up a bunch of times and uh, there was no way yeah it was live it it's, you correct, can't correct, correct. Exactly. And, I, and I've, I've, I've done many live to tape shows and I've done a lot of live to tape shows right here at the Channel 5 and many others, but it's all good. I mean, I honestly, I enjoy it, so I wouldn't I wouldn't do it otherwise. Uh, I, I, I love what I do. Uh, it, it has its uh, it has its moments uh, like I, this morning. I was paying attention that 3000 uh, airline flights have been canceled over the weekend. 3000. Guess what we're going to do on Saturday? You're going to fly? No. Oh, no, you're not flying? We're driving to Kentucky. Oh, because right. Because there is no chance to take, because we would have to take transfer in Charlotte. A friend of mine just the other day went to, to Charlotte, was delayed by four and a half hours. So we decided uh, collectively we're going to jump in the big car and take the 10-hour road trip 
Well, luckily enough, you're going to Kentucky and there's all that bourbon. So after all that stress of driving, you can, you know, go visit a distillery. You don't have to say it twice. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This is our third trip. We already did a distillery. This is trip number three to Kentucky. We love Kentucky and Kentucky loves us. We filmed already uh, with a uh, bourbon and we filmed at Locus Grove. And now we're filming at, uh, how do you pronounce it, Hotspur? Harrodsburg. Harrodsburg. Yeah. Old Fort Herod in Old Kentucky, Herod, yeah. Harrodsburg. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, it, you really do delve into the history and like how different cultures that, you know, were battling over the, the states and, and land and whatnot, um, how their culture is kind of infused into um, our our menus what we create the you know today so it, i like that i like watching that so you know obviously kentucky like i don't i don't know enough history on them other than bourbon um which might speak loudly to people hearing that but um you know i'd be interested in in watching the what you have um coming up too well the the, the thing but what's interesting we we did uh two shows already like i said uh, one I cooked myself exclusively, and the other one I did with a historian chef. Fun. We had a lot of good fun together. Uh, it's it's kind of like, uh, I don't mean this word negatively, because the hillbillies himself used the word proudly uh, as hillbillies, uh, because we, we filmed in the Orsark as well. Uh, they were just very frugal people, and they depended on the product they had available. I mean, think about it in some remote areas, in Kentucky or up in the Ozarks, there wasn't even any highways or railroads for many years to come. You yeah. think about it. So they were used to kind of, they were, actually, they worked very closely with the Native Americans that helped them learn an understanding. And so they, they made their own culture, their own cuisine kind of come forward. So when people always say to me, and, and I had a, an attack yesterday, with people wanted to know, what am I cooking? Do I make a burger stew? I already did burger stew. Burger stew is done with squirrels. I already did squirrel chambalaya in yeah. the bio with uh, with John Falls. I, I mean, I have no problem with uh, ground talk and possum. No problem at all on venison and anything. I, I mean, but the, the thing was, I was when I was talking to you, I was doing something completely different. So what happened is when I was at Locus Cove, uh, which is uh, in Louisville, outside of Louisville, Kentucky. And we filmed, and the, the reason that Locust Coast is famous that uh, Lewis and Clark was one of their stops and the end to kind of celebrate and show the people what they found in, uh, when they traveled for Thomas Jefferson for the Western Extension. Okay. And they, they, they let me see a lot of the books they had in the library. And there was like a, a, a handwritten uh, a booklet that... Uh, like a Union League uh, recipe book. And I was reading this booklet and I'm saying to myself, what's very interesting, if the the, the recipe was written in 1819, they're about, they used a, a, a tomato base. And I, I saw tomatoes didn't uh, uh, came until much later. But then I found out that a lot of European settlers that came over, Italians and Germans for sure, and some French, they brought the seeds along with them, and they grew tomatoes on a small scale way before Thomas Jefferson and everybody said you should eat tomatoes; it's good for you and it's not poisonous, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, but basically, so this particular recipe that you have a taste with you now that I brought you is basically what they they called a boneless hillbilly stew or boneless hillbilly chili. In other words, meaning. It doesn't have squirrel. It doesn't have possum. It has just meat. It's, it's, it's pork, beef, turkey, venison sausage. It has a lot of mushrooms. And again, stuff that would have been grown around. But it's a tomato base, mm -hmm. uh, shallots, garlic, tomato base, uh, obviously some chili powder, a little paprika. And then afterwards, uh, and, and you cook the beans on the side, and then after mix it all together. So that's what I did yesterday. And I got so much uh, email where is the squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, God. So because it's supposed to be like a hillbilly kind of thing. Is that why they were because asking? The and I picked the name because this the name I saw. So yeah. I just thought it was funny. But it wasn't It wasn't even for the show. It was for a friend of mine. It had nothing to do with the show. But people assume everything, everything. <laughs> everything I do is with the show. And yet, 
it's you know you get pigeon nosed into certain things um and i i want to also since you're talking about the fact that you um have been cooking i want to mention the fact that the last time we were on you were on the show you were talking about the spices that you were creating so with you you brought the spices so they're actually already available um and why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about each spice well let me tell you and uh, actually phil can verify it (laughs) because he basically eats them every day he tastes them every day because i make lunch every day i still let, let me tell you this way i'm not promising another book but i'm keeping very close records on uh, what I'm making, okay. pictures and everything else, and notes. So there may be, because the reason I did the spices is that it's very easy to have successful meals when you use those. Those are not, they have very little sodium. Yes, they're expensive, because why they're expensive? Because the, the cheaper ones are giving you 70% uh, sodium and yeah. a little bit of that. And so... I played around with this like crazy during COVID with uh, trying fresh herbs. I have still today a big herb garden. I water my herb garden every morning, talk to them every night, water it again. He gets everything I garnish. I mean, you saw the play today (laughs) that I made for him, which was a a king salmon on top of uh, 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 Japanese uh, uh, eggplant marinara and some tortellini on the side. Beautiful dish. You gotta look at it. Anyway, so when you when, when, when I make when I make <laughs> I put on about twenty pounds in the last year. <laughs> when I make those dishes, I can use it. I mean, nothing else but using my spices. But you gotta have to know what. So some I marinate with which wraps, and other ones are just for flavoring. But if you know what you're doing, you can really cut back. So I did them to give people a chance. For instance. I have one that's called the Taste of History, which is really a spice that is an 18th century spice mix. It has maize, nutmeg, cinnamon, cloves, and other stuff in there. It's very beautiful if you make a stew. It almost reminds you of the, the holiday season Yeah. when you come into it. And then the spectacular is for everything. Mediterranean is not Italian. It's Mediterranean. It goes for anything Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, what he had today, a king salmon that was marinated, in the Mediterranean spice. So all you have to do if you play around a little bit, and a lot of people that have purchased them use it for this uh, for this reason. And this was the reason I did it. The reason, not, and I figured I put my picture on there so they always see me in their kitchen cabinet, you know? <laughs> You know, it's they can see who came up with that, too, and appreciate it even more, Um, you know, and I I know that you said you hinted that you might not make a create another culinary um, book or cookbook. Um, But I was kind of hoping that was one of my questions is what, you know, whether or not you were going to do that or, you know, because one of the books that you have out there, you said you cross referenced it. So if you, you know, want to see the history of that recipe that they can look up that recipe. That, that do, we, we have them. We have the we have the book that uh, is called the Taste of History book. Yes. I am working on another book, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm working on more of a history book right now uh, and maybe a cookbook. So I'm, I think I have two books in me yet. Okay. Depending on what I have no more, no more Dave McCullough to write the forward, unfortunately, but he did write the forward for three books. Think about that. Or watch tomorrow. He's gonna be gonna let the world know about it. I will. <laughs> and and also, um, you know, I I am wondering what okay, with cook regarding cooking, um, with the fact that you cook with tools that are, you know, past in the from the past, is there anything that you like utilizing that you found like I'm you know, I cook I like the um the iron the iron pots yeah. um when you cook the stews is that something where at home would you would you have a preference for like cooking um utilizing something that was from way back when or do you stick with modern just modern tools well i actually cook uh, exclusively in mobile uh cover that's, okay that's my preference and actually the same company that made the uh the pots for thomas jefferson mentioned same, same yes. company same pots i got all that 
because at home it, it's difficult. Uh, you'd have to have a an 18th century home with a big old chimney to do it in. But I will tell you that, honestly, nothing ever tastes better than cooking it in a wrought iron, and I tell you why. It somehow takes the flavor of, the again, the wood and everything around there somehow I cannot explain it. I would have to have to be a, a, a scientist come and take a look at it <laughs> and see. The, it just tastes better. Every time I make something and it's, it's made on, on, on a lot iron, it just tastes better. Do you think it's also because of the seasoning too? Like you season it, the wrought iron? Not, not necessarily. I just think it's the cooking process that you do because you, uh, you cook slower. Now, many times when you watch the show, it's a little misleading because for the viewer, we give a little flame. Normally what you do, you let the flame reduce down and you cook on the coal. Yeah. But just a little ambiance, you could put it in there. And so also to make me extra hot, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because it gets like a severe temperature. So usually what I do, the shows that I got to cook here at, uh, at at the Harrington estate at Charles Thompson's mm -hmm. uh, place, we usually try to do it in January or February when it's not uh, 100, As... 100 degrees, you know, so kind of like, but I'm used to it and I'm used to and, and the islands. I mean, it, it's no problem. I don't I don't have a problem with the heat, stuff like that. But the cooking thing, the, in, the interesting thing is what you've got to remember, all the tools you use, you just got to make sure you take extra good care of it. Uh, you got to, you know, you got to season it, you got to oil it again, you got to make, make sure... There's a lot of uh, TLC that this equipment needs. I and in with that, I want to also mention that you know you're a chef, obviously. So you probably have your set of knives that you carry around. I'm assuming to all the different locations. Well, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Ideally, I, ideally, uh, well, now that if we drive into Kentucky, I can bring my knife roll. But when you fly, it's a real pain, you know. So then, usually, what I do is I talk to whoever worked with me before and see if I can borrow a knife. It's easier than that. So I can work with any knife. Ideally, I I prefer my handles, no question about it. But if I have to, I've I've I cooked with all kinds of stuff. So yeah. And um so we in our last 10 minutes that we have on the show, um, is there anything that with you know somebody who is trying to learn to become a chef or, you know, somebody who wants to get into the hospitality industry, you know, would you have any kind of like recommendations or, you know, what would you, your advice be as, as a seasoned chef? Well, I get this question all the time. And I will tell you, honestly, first of all, contrary to popular belief, please make sure that you get a good culinary degree because what, because life has changed. When I was a young guy, we didn't know anything about, uh, you know, the health inspectors and temperature logs and all this good stuff. I mean, think about it. But think about how everything has, has evolved. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think going to uh, be at the restaurant school or go to the uh, High Park the CIA culinary school uh, or going to Johnson & Wales or yeah. many, it really, there's really no right, no wrong because it's what you take out of it. Now, I get this question a lot while we're on the road, and I tell people, you know, one of the things you might want to do, if you're really serious, start reading my books. And half the time, or not half the time, many times, then I send books. And he, he reminds me that he's really good at it. <laughs> he's going to go to heaven, too, next to uh, McCullough. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and so, basically, I sent, I give him my book. I said, you want to... Start reading a book and understanding. And the other thing is, I think the biggest mistake that was made, I would say about 20 years ago, that uh, uh, some of the bigger uh, uh, colleges, culinary colleges, started off getting everybody crazy. Well, you go to the CIA and you come out and you make $80,000. Oh, you know, and that, that confused a lot of young people. And therefore, they had a huge amount of drop, dropout. Let me honestly tell you, cooking, it's not for everybody, whether you got it or you don't got it. And it's in the heart. And uh, I always tell people that. And sometimes people look at me like, what is he really trying to tell me? We did the same the other night uh, when we did a preview uh, of uh, some of the shows that uh, mm -hmm. Phil produced. So we showed them the first one from Michigan, which was very interesting. 
because I was hung over in a mine. <laughs> oh, there's stories from that episode. I was I was hung over. I was hung over in a mine like you have no idea. The night before was Oktoberfest, and everybody oh, wanted no. to have a drink with me. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. I was so out of it. You have no idea. And how deep were we in the mine? I mean. Like, oh, about a mile. Oh, and that's probably disarming too uh -huh. because you know it's it you don't have any windows you don't have nothing yeah and hungover <laughs> and how <laughs> and how but anyway yeah <laughs> so i lost my thought yeah, now i'm guess. thinking no it's, <laughs> it's all right um so it, it, it was you know regarding advice to uh up up and coming so chefs. Advi advice would mean that uh you, you you have to have uh, love, and uh, like the other day, I was talking like we we showed some of the things, and the audience uh, had a chance to ask questions, and I said, well, think about it. Cooking is most likely the second most sensuous thing you can do to to a friend. I don't know what else. I mean, I you and I know what else. What's number one? Well, yeah, oh, it's FCC we, rules. We, we, we can talk about that on the air, but you can you you can figure it out. But the, the thing the thing of it is is what's beautiful and what I like and what I tell young people is I say, look here, envision this black piece of cardboard or plate or whatever there in front of you, with nothing on it. And now your brain can figure out what to put on this plate. So you create. And guess what? Instant gratification. You don't have to cut your ear off like Van Gogh to find out that you're really not crazy and you're good. You're good. You're a good painter. And so, but I tell people uh, not to be confused. And I think the problem has been, uh, and I shouldn't really knock. I, I, first of all, I won't never knock another network or another uh, a cooking show because I don't consider myself a cooking show. We are more a lifestyle and bringing you history is a little different. But I mean, some some of the shows that are out there are misleading because they're fixed. Now, I've been an Iron Chef, and uh, is it fixed? 100%. Uh, or you should see Hell's Kitchen and other stuff like that. I mean, anybody in Hell's Kitchen would be in labor court every other day for uh, all, kind of, all kind of trouble they're getting into, you know? Yeah. So, so I think that the, the thing, the thing, the, the thing to do is that uh, kids that want to get into this field got to be a re realistic, their expectation. But if you don't have love for it, and if you don't like to clean your own dishes and clean your own plates and be very particular in what you're doing, then you might as well stay uh, in manufacturing or do some do something else, you know? Yeah. So I really, I, I kind of honestly uh, think that it's still a good business. But you got to be open-minded and not be confused what, uh, unfortunately, the industry has done. Because a lot of those for-profit uh, uh, schools, many of them are already closed, as we all know. We won't talk about them. But, you know, and don't forget don't forget my classware. I know, right. Well, speaking of, um, because in the last four minutes of the show, you know, I want you to be able to let people know where to find everything, where to find your books, where to find you online where to find your spices um where to find not obviously the current season but that's about to launch but um your previous 11 seasons yep. um <laughs> and where to find you follow your adventures and don't ever use my uh, cell phone again no no <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> That was a good one. Thank you, Amaris. I owe you one for that. <laughs> well, well, Phil, why don't you uh, jump in quick there? You sound more clear than me where people can find us and everything that we got going on. And an emphasis on my uh, tasting glasses. Yeah. Well, if you're looking for some uh, Taste of History swag, uh, it's all available at a taste of uh, You can click our store button uh, and it'll take you to a bunch of tableware, the spices. Uh, you know, we have the DVDs for sale from previous seasons, upcoming season 12 um cookbooks uh and our website's the only place where if you order a cookbook through there chef stable personally sign he signs packages delivers everything you know we don't have third party service uh he he's uh i'm Mr. faster than amazon we are faster than amazon <laughs> you get the order in he prints the it's label slowly. i package it and it goes to Gladwin post office i'm not kidding you okay yep. and then as chef mentioned we're filming season 13 so 
uh, you know, exciting things. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, at Taste of History Show um, to get updates. We also have a newsletter if you'd like. Um, you can email us at info at stave.com. We'll add you to the newsletter list where you kind of get behind the scenes, get a little bit more personable, um, you know, kind of show some some footage from on the road. You'll 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 see our stories from the road trip, you know, maybe not that mind story yet, but we'll get there. Um, and then, you know, as Chef mentioned, October 1st on PBS and then Amazon Prime and a bunch of other streaming platforms. One more follow up question before I we have to uh, sign off. But um, last time you were here, you were working with Gold Belly. Is was that able to? OK, it did not. Uh, you know, we worked with that for a little while and then we just, you know, kind of realized it wasn't for us. As Chef mentioned, the city tavern is is you know maintained by the national park service so we didn't really want to step on any feet there you know using plus honestly what i saw the other stuff they're peddling i really really didn't want to be next to a hamburger commercial yeah and no, plus... nothing wrong with the hamburger but i just really don't uh, you know I, i'm not it, it's it's kind of like it sounded really good at first because it would make a lot of sense yeah for somebody to get some of those recipes and i i kind of think that they would have especially with Danny Mayer behind it, I would have thought that uh, that would have been a good thing. But then what I saw, all the other stuff they're promoting, there wasn't me. Yeah. I, got, I, would, I want to be careful about that. You know? But it's all right because now we have, you know, your your cookbooks, obviously, that we can find your recipes and yeah. recreate some of those meals. But then also we have your seasonings. So on that note, I just want to thank you again, Walter, for joining us on the show. And I will be binge watching. Taste the history. Fantastic. That's the only that's the only show around. Remember, Wednesday night, 7 30, W H Y Y. I love the I love the show. Thank you for being with us, Chef. Uh, Philly, Philly, Philly. Yep. The swimming with the pigs. Okay. <laughs> Philly restaurant reviews.com for all information about the show. You can find me across social media at AR Pollocus, or if you'd like to be a sponsor or guest on the show, you can email me at arpollocus at gmail.com. And if you'd like to get in touch with Gene Blum, you can reach him at ibfoodie2 at yahoo.com or follow him on ibfoodie2 on all social media platforms. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you.